Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Who's excited to be here? Am I the only one? I know I'm not. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited to be here today. I, I just believe today's message is going to really help a lot of people. But before I get too ahead of myself, I just want to take a moment, introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, give it up for yourselves. You're an amazing group of people. We love you so much. And also, would you give it up for our first-time visitors today, our first-time guests? Come on, yes. We're excited you're here. It's a big step to come to a new place on a Sunday morning, and uh, we just, we appreciate that so much, and we, we love the fact that you decided to join us and spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, we have a mission here at the church. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus if um, if you'd like to take notes, or if you don't like to take notes, there are some notes that you can take. You probably got handed a bulletin on your way in, and there's some message notes inside of there, so you can follow along with the, the scriptures, and there might be like one fill in the blank today. I don't know. We got to have at least one fill in the blank, or it's, a, it's just not church for us if we don't have a fill in the blank somewhere. I don't know what it is about that. We just like it. We just like that. But also, if you're, if you're a little more digital, uh, you can download the YouVersion Bible app, and you can find Lifeline Church on the YouVersion Bible app, and you can follow along with the message notes there. So it's kind of fun, kind of cool thing to do. A couple quick housekeeping items for you before we jump in. Uh, Life Groups launched last week. Come on, who's excited for Life Groups? They just launched. I think we had over 100 people sign up last week, which was really exciting. Um, very, very fun. Um, groups were happening all this week, last week, but it's not too late. That's what I wanted to tell you. It's not too late. If you uh, download the Church Center app and you can uh, go surfing around for, or ask anybody with a Dream Team badge on, honestly, they'll be able to help you navigate that and maybe find a group, a walking group. There's pickleball, Bible studies, um, even kids groups. We have kids life groups. A lot of people don't know this, but on Wednesdays, we have kids life groups where your own children can go and experience the same kind of community and group, and they're going to be taught the Word of God, but also, you know, develop their friendships with their, with their little tiny cute friends. It's, it's really fun. But then you can drop them off, and you can go, yes, that's worth a clap right there. And then you can go to your group on Wednesday night, kid-free, y'all. Come on. You know what it is. You know what time it is. I got young kids in the house. I know what I need to get to a group. And so that's all going on, and it's not too late to get into a group even right now. Um, next thing, last thing, I just want to let you know, it's growth track step two is today. It's step two is today's where we help you find your spiritual gifts, and we help you go through a personality profile so that you can know um, how God wired you, how God put you together in a, in a special way so that you can serve and be a part of the body of Christ in maybe a way that you never thought about before. Maybe a way that um, you've only thought, well, I don't know, you just put me where you want or I'm just going to show up. But really, life gets fun when it's not all about just what we're doing on Sundays. When we start living outside of ourselves, it gets really fun. So step two of Growth Track is today. Uh, even though it's step two, not step one, uh, I'm inviting you to be a part of that. I'm inviting you to be a part of that day, and our leaders are ready to receive you. It's after second service, um, so grab some breakfast, grab some lunch, come on back, and then you can, you can head in to that. So we're in the series called When Life Hurts, because it just does sometimes. <laughs> <Am I? laughs> come on, it doesn't it? Doesn't life hurt sometimes? It, it does. And, and when, it, when it hurts, um, we, we have a tendency to ask, God, where are you? God, where are you? My life is hurting. I thought it wasn't supposed to be like this. Why, why, God, are you letting me go through this? God, where are you? Why are you letting this happen to me? God, are you even good? Can you see all this pain I'm going through? This series is so important because we need to understand what God is doing in the midst of our pain so that we can see his goodness when life hurts and so that we don't lose our way when life hurts because it just does. Life hurts sometimes. And that's why this series is so important. It's a great opportunity to bring your friends to because if they're maybe haven't, they're not used to coming to church or they're outside of like the, the normal like flow and rhythm of, of coming to church and hearing about the Lord, this topic is going to be applicable to a lot of people. That's just what I'm letting you know. So feel free, invite everyone you can, invite anybody that you're, you're close with or might need a message like this. Of course, last week uh, we talked about trials 
And of course, I went through an actual trial. In my, in my trials was an actual trial. But uh, if you're new here, you're just going to have to get used to that. I went through a Salvation Army program. All right, clean us over, doing good. Lo- for a long time now. Okay, I'm doing better now. That's why I have to wear a suit jacket to, comp- to compensate. To compensate. So you can't see all my neck tattoos. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm, just, I'm just joking around. I'm kidding, y'all. Um, but we talked about trials, and we talked about the fact that trials, the, the, what makes trials difficult is you don't know the outcome. You don't know what that trial is going to produce. You don't know what the end result is going to be of any given trial, and that's what makes it tough. If we knew the outcome of the trial, it wouldn't be that hard. If we knew God was going to come through and restore the relationship and fill my bank account back up and, oh, all my friendships are going to be back on and I'm going to get all my Instagram followers back or whatever it is that I'm just making fun. I'm just making light of a serious thing. If we knew the outcome of whatever pain we were dealing with, whatever trial we were dealing with, it wouldn't be a, tr- a trial. And, but we talked about last week, that's what makes us mature. It's what makes us mature. And we go through these trials when life hurts and we're going through a trial. That's what makes us, don't you, haven't you ever seen someone like that where they can go through so much pain, so much like suffering and they still seem okay. And you look at them and you go, how, how do you do it? <laughs> how are you alive right now? I've, I've felt that way because we, we have people that have been through certain things and we look up to them. Trials produce that in our life. If you missed it, if, you, if you're going through a trial and you missed last week, go back on YouTube, go back on Facebook, check it out. But about life hurting and talking more about today, there's a truth that we all know uh, about pain. And that we, what we know is true in our minds is pain is meant to be a deterrent from wrong choices. Pain is meant to be a deterrent Like the physiological response of pain, literal pain. Like I put my hand on a stove, ouch, that hurts. Don't do that. If I didn't feel pain, I would lose my hand. It would be on fire and I'd go, oh, that's not good. I wouldn't know because the fact that I feel pain, boom, jogs me back to where I'm supposed to be. We all know this is true. We know that, you know, you stub your toe in the middle of the night and you say some pretty ungodly things, all right? (laughs) You don't have to admit it. I know it. I know you do. And that reminds you or that teaches you, don't walk that way anymore, right? We know that pain is supposed to be a deterrent from lasting damage, from permanent damage. How about uh, any parents in the, in the room and you're trying to um, inflict some pain on your children? Not like, come on, I'm not saying you're beating them. But like, let's say the real pain is, is when you take their device away. Take their tablet away. The world has ended, y'all. Come on, moms. You know what I'm talking about. Just give them the phone. We're good to go for another 30 minutes, okay? But you take that device away. You ground them. That pain, what what are you trying to do? You're you're, You're trying to show them some pain so that they don't do the thing that caused that. That's what discipline is. That's what correction is supposed to be. But we tend to get mad at our pain as adults, as grown people, we get mad at our pain, but not our choices. What's up with that? What, what is up with that? Let me explain. And I'm not going to put it on you anymore. I'm going to take it on myself, okay? Uh, once I was flying down the freeway, and then I went over an overpass. This is over in, in Yuba City, where I'm, I'm originally from. And I was just visiting there. I lived here, but I was just visiting there, visiting my parents and whatever. And I'm going over the overpass from Marysville into Yuba City. And it's over the, it's the 10th Street Bridge. And there's a, there's a off-ramp that comes off of there. And there's some baseball diamonds right here. If you know, you know. And you can just come roaring off of that off-ramp. There's a couple like that around here, like in Lodi, coming from Stockton. And there's that off-ramp. You know, coming in on that, you're, you're a one. You feel the G-forces. You just love it, right? Well, what if there was a cop right there? You know, you would be busted. All of us would be busted because we love that off-ramp. It feels so good to drive fast. And so I'm driving off this off-ramp. I feel so good. I'm cooking 65 miles an hour in like a 35. I am booking it, booking it. There's a cop right there. Busts me. I am dead to rights, absolutely busted. And here's the, here's the beautiful part about getting a ticket in a city you're not from. If you want to do traffic school, I had to go back to that city to do traffic school in their county, all right? I'm mad at the cop. I'm mad at the fact that they want to send me over there to do traffic school. You know what didn't occur to me? Maybe shouldn't have been speeding, bro. 
Maybe you shouldn't have been doing that. We get mad at our situation. We get mad at our situation. We get mad at the circumstance. We get mad at the pain. We get frustrated with our pain in life. But maybe, maybe God wants to get our attention with the pain. Maybe God's trying to slow us down so that we don't lose our lives. Did you ever think of that? To get us to reconsider our choices. When life hurts, maybe God is causing or even allowing the pain which in my mind is the same thing. If you're causing it or allowing it, it feels the same to me. Um, and some of you don't like hearing that. Some of that, that rubs against your theology a little bit. Well, God would never, oh, well, he would just never do anything to ever cause me any pain ever. I should know I've been to church and they t- God loves me. And love means he'll never ever, well, hang on just one moment, just one second, because I have a, a, a quick scripture, one among many, but this one's, this one's good, okay? Um, uh, Second Chronicles 15, when this is talking about the Israelites, and you, you got to remember the Israelites, they were just like us. Young, dumb, and stupid, all right? We were just young, broke, and stupid. That's what Dave Ramsey says. Excuse me, I should know that. I'm leading that, that life group tonight. <laughs> and and this, is what, this is what the word says, that God troubled them with every sort of distress. God troubled them with every sort of distress. So the Israelites, they were, they were, they were worshiping idols, they were going against everything. They were debauchery, revelry. They were cursing. They were doing everything. They were, they were just going for it. You read any, you know, any Bible reading plan where you get to the Old Testament, you know, and you're reading through it and you're like, and it's just like back and forth and God saves them and then he, and then he hurts them and then he saves them and then he's like draws them back to him. And then he's, it's like, come on guys, we would never do that right? <laughs> we would never go in and out of, of good seasons with God, right? Never, never. We would never do that. We would never do that. Um, whether he inflicted it or allowed it, it worked. And that's the beautiful thing. It worked. It brought the people of God back to him. And that's what he wanted. That was the, that was the thing. And that's what I want to talk about today is that we need to understand why God uses or even allows or even inflicts or just allows pain to happen in our lives, to get our attention, to correct us when we've lost our way. When we're not as focused on the right things as we should be, God brings some pain in our lives. And just because you're experiencing some pain, I'm gonna talk about this all day, but just because you're experiencing some pain does not mean he loves you. In fact, it probably means he loves you best because he doesn't want you to to continue in pain. Um, Here's something you all know. Um, and there's something that preachers love to preach. We're God's children. Oh, aren't we? We're just, we're, we're children, of, sons and daughters of the most high God, heirs to receive everything that he, he has for us, right? You know, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I don't know how it goes. It's something like that. And we love stuff like that. I love being a son of God. I love being a, well, I'm not a daughter, but you know, I'm a child of God. Let's just move on here. Galatians 4. Galatians 4 talks about this, and we love this topic. Uh, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves into the law so that we could, uh, so he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we're his children, God has sent his spirit uh, of, of being a son of our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father, Now you are no longer a slave. There it is. That's where I was looking for. No longer a slave, but God's own children. And since you are his children, God has made you his heir. Every preacher loves to preach that. Every person in church loves to hear that. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a son. I'm a daughter. Yeah. That's what, yes, yes. And every good and perfect treat comes from God. And every good and perfect gift comes from God. And it's true. It's true, but no one wants to talk about what's next for sons and daughters. Do you remember living in your parents' home? Okay, do I need to remind you what it was like? Do I need to remind you? And they were imperfect, so let's talk about what it means to be children of God for just a moment. Let's get real about this. Let's talk truly what it means. Hebrews 12. Let's talk about this. And have you forgotten the encouraging word God spoke to you as children? Now, this is supposed to be encouraging. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Let me encourage you. You're going to be disciplined. (laughs) Skip this chapter. And don't give up when he corrects you. 
when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. We need to understand this if we're gonna actually get the benefit from it. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? Now, back then, it was completely unheard of to not be disciplined. Nowadays, it's all too common. Nowadays, it's very, very common. Even if we think we got disciplined hard, probably not that hard. Okay, back then, it was the norm. I mean, these men were grown men ready to strike out on their own by like 15, 16. Our culture is much, much different today. And so they're speaking, he's speaking to a culture in Hebrews, this author is speaking to a culture that understands real discipline, real discipline. So if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers, We're going to talk about this. Since we respected or supposedly respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of our father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, keywords, doing the best they knew how. Doing the best they knew how, right? It's important for us to honor our parents, whether they were good or bad. I know it's hard sometimes. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. And that's the point. That's the point. That we're supposed to share in his holiness. We're supposed to become more like him. That there's things in us that are not like him. And when we get disciplined, when we get corrected, it makes us more like him. And he's drawing us back to the image of of his son, his perfect son. And so that's how we're supposed to be sharing in his holiness. That's the simple goal. We're supposed to be more like this. But here's, let's get back to this idea. Most of us, we didn't respect our fathers and our mothers. At least we didn't respect their discipline. All right, we tried. We tried. And, and I don't care how, how good of a kid you were, there were times that we did not receive the correction the way we should. Even if we did on the outside, Even if we did what we were told on the outside, on the inside, we were fighting it. On the inside, okay? Um, I mean, who's ever really met a kid? And I had somebody this week, I always preview my message with Salvation Army guys. I go down there and do a Bible study, and I had somebody say, well, I was, I always did that. He's sitting in rehab, by the way. Okay, okay. He's like, oh, yeah, I always did what my parents said. Oh, yeah, I was always, always receiving their correction. (laughs) Okay, sure. All right, bud. Yeah, let me know after your six-month rehab program is over. Tell me how well you were just, like, trained up. He's not here, thank God. (laughs) No, he's not watching online. I'm so sorry, brother. I'm going to owe you a dollar, you know, for that. But who ever heard of a kid that said, Mom, Dad, I'm so glad you found out what I did. You know what? You know what? This is perfect. This is, this is actually perfect because now I, I, I was wrong and I can see that now. And I, I just think you should discipline me the best you know how. And I just can't wait for this discipline that's come. I, come on. No, no kid really ever does that, especially with earthly parents. I mean, we just don't like discipline. Even if we know we're wrong, we don't like discipline. Actually, if we already realize we're wrong, we think that's punishment enough. It's like, as soon as I got pulled over, I'm like, oh, I knew it. Oh, don't give me the ticket. I, I won't do it again. I get it. Don't we think that? We think it without thinking. It's subconscious. Like, oh, I realized what I did wrong. Oh, I don't need the punishment. I don't need the correction. Oh, you got me. You know, as soon as it leaves my mouth, oh, I knew it. No, don't worry about it. You don't need to punish me. You don't need to correct me at all. But that's not how it works, is it? That's not how it works because we just don't like correction. We don't want it. We, we hardly ever receive it the way that we should. We feel bad. Isn't that enough? You know, um, when I was in the Salvation Army, I'm going to talk about that a lot today, but when I was in that program, I was in uh, the rehabilitation program, this was about like 16 years ago, something like that, and I I did something that I shouldn't have done. I signed my own meeting card. I've told this story before, you're going to have to hear it again. I signed my own meeting card. I was supposed to get a meeting every day. I signed my meeting card. I forged it, so I didn't really go. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I was like barely saved, and I was just learning what conviction felt like barely. I'm like 21 years old. First time I ever been convicted about anything, hardly. And I felt conviction. I'm like, man, I got to, I got to turn myself in. This is not right. And so I turned myself in. I've been in there six months. I had six months to go. I turned myself in and they're like, Elliot, we're so proud of you for doing this. Pack your bags. I had to go to jail 
for three months for turning myself in. I was like, uh, what? I thought I was going to get an attaboy. I thought I was proud of myself. Don't we get that way sometimes? Like, oh, I know I did wrong. So I'll just say sorry. And then everything's fine. Don't we, because we don't, we, we don't receive correction well. In our society, in our culture, we aren't taught to receive it well. We're actually taught the antithesis of correction. We're taught to just, no, I should never need to receive anything like that. So if we don't think we're wrong, we don't think we need the correction. And if we do acknowledge we're wrong, we don't think correction is needed. So we're never happy with it. And the biggest reason, this is what I want to zero in on for just a minute. Uh, the biggest reason we struggle with discipline from God is because we may not have been disciplined very well by our earthly parents. Do not elbow the person next to you, especially if they're related to you in any way. Okay. We're going to talk about parenting for just a minute. I'm going to talk about you as parents, but I'm going to talk about you as a kid too, when you were being parented. Uh, we maybe we're not disciplined the right way. And I am a big, big advocate of honoring your parents. My parents did a pretty good job. They did a really, really, really good job. And the fact that I went off the deep end was not their fault at all. Hope you're listening. You, I've told them that many times. And if you have a child that has, you know, gone wayward, do not, do not necessarily have to blame yourself for that. People make their own choices. My parents did a wonderful, wonderful job raising me, but we weren't always disciplined the right way, were we? No, we were not. Parenting is all about raising a child to be a child of God. That's what it's all supposed to be about. Our first disciplers is supposed to be our parents. Supposed to be our parents. Of course, we don't think that way now. It's like, I'm gonna drop my kid off at the youth group and you know, you take them, you take care of them. So when I'm at home, I don't have to do it. I'm not saying you, any of you do that. That was harsh, I'm so sorry. But we do have a tendency, you know I mean? All of us have to fight urges of like not wanting to go through the hard, because it's hard work. And we want our kids to be happy with us. We have to live with them, right? I get it. I, I get all of that. I, I do. But it's all about raising uh, children to be grown people. We're trying to raise followers of Jesus. So a couple problems that may have happened in your home or that maybe are happening and it's worth evaluating is number one, uh, maybe some of us weren't disciplined enough by our parents, weren't disciplined enough. So what tends to happen in that situation is um, we think we should always get our way because I wasn't disciplined enough. So I think I should always get my way, but God does not share that idea. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't share that idea. So Life hurts when we get older. Uh, that's problem one. Problem number two is uh, we were disciplined wrongly by our parents. Uh, this one's a little tougher um, because they aren't perfect, all right? Nobody's perfect. As much as they try, maybe they were raised very poorly, so they didn't have the tools, right? And so when we get disciplined, um, you know, we, we see it as anger instead of love because maybe it was. Um, that's a problem. That's, a, that's more of a serious problem, and I understand that. But because we weren't disciplined correctly growing up, that's why we have a hard time receiving it or giving it as an adult. That's problem number two. Problem number three is uh, many kids, uh, you know, are, are, and many parents, I should say, just want their kids to be happy <laughs> all the time, like always. Like any and all pain is always universally bad. Anything bad, like a butterfly lands on your daughter's shoulder. Get this kid out right here. My harder. It's like any little thing. Like I have to just protect my kid from anything bad that ever happens. And the, the kids should be happy always. Every Christmas, every birthday, it's whatever you want. I'm going to go into debt every holiday for you, baby girl, because I love you. And that's what love is. And we're, te we're teaching our kids that they ought to get whatever they want, whenever they want. Otherwise, they're not loved. And any and all pain is bad. Whoa, that's a tough one. I'm so sorry. Some of, the room got quieter than I thought it was going to be, so I'm so sorry if that was you. I don't struggle with that. Just ask Emma. She's like, he, don't, he barely cares. He's ready to discipline me at any moment. I love her, but, man, I'm not, like, I'm not sheltering her, man. I'm letting her, I'm letting her get better, you know, and I'm letting, I'm letting Evan. I try my best anyways. Uh, that's, that's a problem, though, protecting our kids from any and all pain and wanting them to be happy at every moment. That's bad. Um, that's a problem. Number four, uh, we, we, we tend to correct actions. So in, it's always twofold. It's maybe this has happened to you. 
or maybe it's something that you struggle with so, and maybe it happened to you, but the, the actions get corrected instead of confronting the heart, okay? So Jesus explained our words and our behavior come from our hearts. So are we discipling or were you discipled or are we simply micromanaging behavior? Now, let me just, you know, get on the flip side of this. This is one I really struggle with. I, I struggle with this one because that's just kind of in my nature. I'm, I'm a bit of a, you know, I'm always like, just close the door. You're letting flies in. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, chew with your mouth closed. You know, it's like behavior. And because it's hard work to always be going back to, well, you want to respect people next to you. Like, hey, we all live in the same house. Trying to let swarms of flies in. You know, we're all here. Um, don't leave the house a mess not just because I want you to pick it up, but because, look, we all live, we're all living together and we ought to respect. It's not just mom's job to do everything. And so we're all, amen. <laughs> amen. Let's give a round of applause for every mom in the house today. Let's go. Make your kids clean it up. Sorry. Are we discipling or are we micromanaging? Were you micromanaged or were you discipled? So evaluate that in your heart because we might struggle with correction if that's the case. Um, how about conforming the will? Um, I, I almost went with breaking the will, but I thought that might have been too strong. So it's our job as parents to conform the will, to conform the will. Um, parents' intended purpose is to pr- prepare our kids to live out God's will, not their own. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. How many kids have you ever heard say that? Much less adults. You know, we say it, but do we mean it? Um, see, we all have a will, and if our will is not taught submission as a child, God is going to have to break it as an adult. And that's when life hurts. Okay, so Kids got to learn, you know, Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 11 says this, Hebrews 12, 11 says, no discipline is enjoyable when it's happening. It's painful, but afterward there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in its way. We need to be trained this way. Uh, a peaceful harvest of righteousness for who? Everyone? No. For people who are trained by discipline, trained in correction, those who receive his correction. Here's the way it works. Anything that's in our heart, our will, our actions, that's not holy. God is going to correct. He's going to correct it. And it often comes through as life hurting. So we've probably all had teaching moments all of our lives. You know, early on, it's usually very easy. You know, when you're, when you're in kindergarten and you cut in line and the teacher says, oh, don't cut in line, Susie, don't cut in line. And then you're like, walk to the back. You're like, as soon as you're not looking, I'm going back to the middle. All right. What's up? But if you had a good teacher, they explained, hey, you know, when you, when you go to the middle of the line, it devalues everyone behind you. And you're showing disrespect to them. And it's really, it's really fueling selfishness inside of you. If you had a good teacher, they were explaining that to you. And if you received that correction and learned that then when it was nice and easy, then life is easier. But if you reject that, like many of us do, if you reject the correction early, life is going to hurt later on because it's going to get harder and harder. And the correction is going to become more fierce and more fierce. If we don't receive the easy teaching, we'll need to be corrected again and again. God's going to bring it when we know what God wants but don't do it, then God will use the pain of correction to get our attention. Um, You know, God said, uh, forgive because you're forgiven. If not, there's gonna be pain in your heart called bitterness. And you're gonna have to experience that pain. So he's not just telling us what to do. He's trying to teach us how to live because it's gonna benefit us. There's gonna be pain in your relationship, loss of a relationship, and your life will hurt until you do it God's way. Jesus said, uh, don't be a law guy. You ever heard that one? Log eye, you know, you gotta, you're trying to get the speck out of your friend's eye because you see what they're doing wrong, but you can't see, you got a plank coming out of your eye. <sighs> That's funny, I don't know. We used to sing a song in the Salvation Army called Log Eye. I cannot stop with the Salvation Army stories today. I don't know what my deal is. Um, he said, Jesus said, don't, don't ha- take the plank out of your eye. If you don't, there's going to be pain in all your relationships because you're going to think everybody else is wrong and you're always right. Your life is going to hurt. Your marriage is going to hurt. Your relationships at work is going to hurt. Your friends, your family, life is just going to hurt if you live that way. It's not because I just want you to do what I say. It's because this is the way of life I'm trying to teach you to live. Number three, God says, uh, be wise with your spending. Save for tomorrow. Uh, be generous and honor God with the tithe. And if not, there's going to be pain in your finances. And you're like, man, I wonder why I'm always like struggling at work. I always want a new job. It's like, I was always stressed at work. And I'm like, my finances, I'm always like wanting more or, you know, People would look at you and say, you have so much, but you always feel anxiety and stress. 
God says, live my way. Look, I'm, try- I'm trying to correct you. That's where that anxiety is coming from. That's where that pressure is coming from. It's pain to, to, to bring correction. Ooh. Okay, we'll move on from that one. All right. God says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. If, you're, if you don't, your, your words are going to cause pain in every relationship you have, your marriage, your work, everything. And life is going to hurt. God says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, you know, eat well, exercise. If not, I mean, this one's easy to understand. You're like, <laughs> uh, uh, it's like my neck, my back, just like everything is just going to be totally broken and mismanaged. He, he's, God tries to show us through pain, look, you ought to be doing it differently. Treat your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. God says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If not, there's going to be pain in all areas of your life. And that's the real point. The discipline of God is meant for children he loves because he wants better things for us. He wants better things for us. Deuteronomy 11 says this. Look, today I'm giving you the choice between blessing and a curse. You will be blessed if you obey the commands of the Lord your God I'm giving you today. But if you, you will be cursed. In other words, you're going to have to face consequences. You're going to have to face discipline. You know, curse just isn't like a hex on you. It's like the curse is I'm going to have to be corrected. I'm going to have to be disciplined. The Lord's pain is going to come on me if I don't choose his way of life. If you reject the commands of the Lord your God and, and, and turn away from him, okay? The, the pain, the curse, the consequence, the correction is meant to bring us to the blessing God has for us. If he didn't care about you, why would he correct you? That's a great question. That ought to make you think. If he didn't love you, why would he care? If he didn't love us, why would he care enough to bring correction, to bring that pain, to bring that check in our heart? It's supposed to bring us to him. Uh, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 7 um, says this. This is Paul writing to a uh, church in Corinth. He says, I'm not sorry I sent you that severe letter. <laughs> okay, Paul, <laughs> that's funny, right? It's like, I'm not sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. You seem really great. <laughs> I was sorry at first because I know it was painful for you for a little while, but now I'm glad I sent it because, not because it hurt you, but because of the pain it caused you to repent. And change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have so that you will not be harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Have you ever taken a kid to the beach? I have. I'm not going to tell stories about my own kids because I keep owing them dollars every time I tell stories about them and I I'm running out of ones. Okay, so any kid. How about your kid? You take your kid to the, to the beach and the first thing they do if they're like one, two years old, you, you know, they, they dig their hands in that. Oh, yeah. Get, get them a handful of sand. That's right. Go right down the hatch, right? They start eating that wet sand, and they just love it. They think it's so good. They're like, they're like, <laughs> their lips go inside. And, and you're like, what are you doing? I brought ice cream sandwiches. You're not going to be able to enjoy this ice cream sandwich. You got a mouthful of sand. You're going to be like crunch, crunch, crunch. And if you're anything like me, you run up and you're like, no, slap the sand out of there. And then you slap the sand out of their hand. What do they do? They cry. (laughs) Why are you hurting me? Why are you letting me do it? (laughs) Why is sand? It's good. Yummy. Like what? You try to help them. And that's, that's our issue. We're trying to live our best life with a mouthful of sand. And we don't even know. We don't even know what God has for us. When all we see, like, why is he taking this away from me? Why isn't he letting me eat it? Because he has ice cream for you. I don't know how else to say it. Preacher said, God's going to give me ice cream. (laughs) It's, It's an illustration that the thing we think we want does not compare to the thing that God has for us. It's sweet. It's creamy. I want an ice cream sandwich right now, actually. I wish I had one. There's only one thing that we can do when we're faced with God's correction. And this is the most popular thing to ever preach in church ever. I cannot wait to share this word with you. I hope you're ready for it because it's so encouraging. It's going to bless you so much. There's only one thing we need to do when God corrects us, and that's repent. Repent. That's how I always hear it. Like it gets, the voice gets a deep repent. You got to repent. Repent. It's the only thing. It's the only thing we can do. And I, I just, you know, let you know, it's, it's unpopular. I know. I know. Come on. I'm joking around. I know it's unpopular to preach this. 
but maybe it doesn't get preached the right way. I think I, think I could figure out a way to preach it the way it's encouraging. Repenting actually is a blessing. I, I know everyone wants to hear how much God loves them. You want to hear how much God loves you and that he's going to bless you and he's going to bring you into the land of unlimited ice cream where you never gain a pound and you watch football all day. I know, because that, that's where I want to be. But I'm telling you, that God loves you and wants to bless you. And the only way to get that blessing and have the kind of life he wants you to have even here on earth is to repent. Listen to Acts chapter three. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that, say so that. So that your sins may be wiped away and times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. Man, repentance leads to refreshment. This is not a bad word. This is a good word. That when, we're, when we face pain in life and we're being corrected, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that. I know it's not right, but it feels so good. But if I can, get, if I can bring myself to God's way, that it's actually a refreshment and you have no idea what's waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. It's a blessing. God loves you so much that he died for you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. I hope you've heard that. I hope you heard that before. I hope you heard a hundred times. I should say that every single week. He loves you just the way you are, but too much to leave you just that way. He loves you. He wants to bless you, but that's why he corrects you. God is so loving, so kind, so merciful that even when he's correcting, sometimes we don't even feel it. <laughs> we brush it off. You know, this is what happens. This is what happens. We sin and, you know, we look at something we shouldn't look at. Um, we do something with our finances we shouldn't do. Uh, we, we don't do something we should do. We, 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 we do something with someone that we shouldn't be doing. I'm just like <laughs> almost getting there, but not quite. I hope you are connecting the dots. But we do things that we know or have a feeling aren't right. And then we look around and the sky doesn't fall. And we think, oh, I'm good to go. Because God's correction is gentle. He is kind. And he doesn't slap you across the face. He says, son, I have something. Come. He's like trying to, he's, cause he's kind and he's merciful. But, but Romans, Romans chapter two says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Man, this is, this is the danger zone for us when we know we're not doing the exact right thing, but then we're just like allowed to walk in it and it doesn't seem like anything's going wrong. That's dangerous to us. That's the danger zone, danger zone for us because he's so kind, he's so loving. But instead of repenting, we get angry at God when life gets painful. We get angry at him and instead of, instead of just receiving his correction, we, we need to break free and, and repentance is not just a kid saying sorry. It's not just sorry, I learned. No, 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 no. Rep repentance means this. Uh, repent means to change one's way of life. Let's put it on the screen so I can know what I wrote. Repent means to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin. With regard to sin. First, we have to change our thoughts and attitudes about what God considers sinful. That's, that's step one. We have to identify sin for what it is. King David said, I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. Well, the question has to be, what if we're living a certain way, doing a certain thing that doesn't please God, but we don't want to call it sin? Yikes. The definition of sin is a transgression against divine law. If you decide what's right and wrong, then you are making yourself the divine. And we don't get to decide what sin is. God does. If we disagree with God about what offends him, our life is going to hurt as a loving father tries to correct us. I'm gonna leave you with a challenge today, all right? There's just one challenge. Of course, it's to repent, but I'm gonna put it in a certain way that hopefully, not that y'all are sinful or you're bad. I, I happen to love every single one of you and think you're doing great. But if there's an area of your life that needs to change, I hope, I hope you could bring yourself to change it because there's blessing waiting on the other side. I'm gonna leave you with this challenge when Joshua was the, was the guy that came after Moses. Moses, Egypt, the 10 plagues, the Red Sea, the land that God promised them. Moses took him out, but then Moses died and then there was Joshua. We track him so far. And Joshua conquered all the promised land and all the people were with him and he was able to like be there with them and show them the way. But as soon as they got into the promised land, Joshua knew. Joshua knew that um, people were going to spread out. 
and they were going to live in their own tribes and he wasn't going to have face-to-face contact with them anymore. And this was Joshua's declaration and this is what he told them. Joshua 24, verse 15. He says, choose today whom you're going to serve. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. We've all heard, maybe you've heard that. We haven't all heard it, but maybe you've heard it. If you've been to Hobby Lobby, you've definitely seen it on like a, on a wall hanging piece of art, right? <laughs> it's a very hang, hang upable scripture. As for me and my family, you know, we're going to serve the Lord. But you have to understand, he was talking to a people that were about to go their own way. And like all the stories after the book of Joshua are not too good because he was trying to let them know, man, hey, I know it's about to be up to you and I want you to decide to serve the Lord. I believe this is God's word, okay? This is your Bible, 66 books. This is God's word. This is what he gave us. This is his instruction for life. This is what he imparted to us. This is what defines sin for me. Okay, I know it's easy to be like, well, I don't know if that, that one thing, you know, we, and we think we know better. We know better. And I'm not saying to not have compassion. I, I'm a compassionate, encouraging person. That's just the way I flow. It's the way I like it. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide, my family and me, we're going to live by this set of standards. I'm going to live this way. And I'm just telling you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to decide for yourself, everybody. How are you going to live? What's going to set the standard for you? There's many, oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry about that. Sweeping things all over the place. That was God's spirit, you see? <laughs> cool. There's, um, there's many causes there's many causes in life that, that cause us to, to have pain. Maybe it's our own choices. Maybe it's maybe something you didn't even do. I believe God can use all of that pain to correct us and bring us back to him, to bring us back to his way of life, to bring us back to his blessing, his goodness, whether you, whether you earned it or not, you know, whether you did something that you can see or you can't see, whatever, any and all pain we experience in life is an opportunity for us to evaluate How's my life going? Where, where, where am I headed? You know, am I, living, am I living this way? That's what I want for you. So at the end of every service, we always do this, but I want to give you an opportunity to, to make Jesus, number one, your savior. Where if you've never had an opportunity to do that, if you've never, you know, just confess the fact that you ever had sin in your life and say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sin, that's making him your savior. Where if you die today, you're you're good to go. But I want to make a second offer that's you know, just as important. And it impacts your day-to-day life. It's making him Lord. It's, it means saying, Jesus, I'm going to choose to live your way. I'm going to make you the Lord of my life. And what you say, like, I don't want to live, I don't want to eat sand all the way to heaven. You know, I don't want to eat sand all the way to heaven. I don't want to live my whole life thinking I know what's best with my get out of hell free card. I actually wanna make you Lord. So now's a great time for that. If you're experiencing pain especially, right now is a great opportunity to say, Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, show me. Show me what I need to do. Show me the correction that I need. So I'm just gonna invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Just very simple prayer that we can pray together. Let me pray over you, and then I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Father, I pray for open hearts today. I pray for open minds. I pray that your word has revealed something to us today so that we can, so we can walk in your goodness. We can walk in your blessing. And now with heads staying down, it's a private moment between you and the Lord for now. If there's anyone here that that resonates with you, that that you're ready to make a decision like that, you're ready to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, would you just lift your hand up with me and say, that's me. I'm I'm ready to go. Amen. I see you. Hallelujah. Amen. I see you. I see you too. And you. Hallelujah. And you. And you. Hallelujah. God sees you. God sees you. It's not as much important as I see you. God sees your hand. You can put it down. 
Thank you, all of you, for taking that step. But what we're going to do now is we're going to pray together as a family. So church, I'm going to invite everyone to pray this prayer together so no one feels like they're praying alone today. Just say it with me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me the way to go. Keep me from trouble and pain. In Jesus' name, amen.